Welcome to The Blast Podcast. I'm your host, Ray Kell. This podcast is to help you experience being blessed that transcends a mere hashtag. Now, let me add my disclaimer, especially for today. I am not a preacher, prophet, or Bible scholar, but I am a God-worshiping, Jesus-loving, Bible-believing, New Thought Christian. You're in the right place. I'm broadcasting on WY TV7 Christian Broadcasters Network, a nonprofit charitable radio broadcast with a mission to empower, encourage, and educate. Donations are welcome to help us further this mission. You can donate at www.wytv7.org. Today's Blessed Podcast is sponsored by Blessed Mind Coaching. Are you ready to elevate your thinking, develop an abundance mindset, and release the limiting beliefs that are keeping you from living an abundant life? Then join the five-day Elevate Challenge. It's free. Go to www.rakeltosin.com. So this is the end of February, and we have been talking about love. February is also Black History Month. So we're going to keep in with the love, but we're going to add some Black history. And I have with me one of my dear friends that we've gone, we went to college together. We went to an HBCU, Florida A&M University. Um, And her name is Danita Smith. And she is going to help me talk about our topic today. Danita, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Raquel, how are you? I'm great. So um, before we get started, Danita has a website of, that where you can get a lot of Black history facts. Tell them your um, website page. So it's blackandeducation.com. And what I do is I produce stories about Black history. So I've written this book. And what I do, I do a podcast of my own. And I also do, I write and I blog about it. There's a lot of stuff that goes into history. So I write stories that inspire me. One of the things I think about is a lot of times we think about nuggets and facts and not the humanness behind the stories that we lived right. and our ancestors lived. So I write about stories that inspire me to really make you think beyond just the headlines. Really, what was that person going through and what's the lesson we can get out of that life? So you can find that at blackandeducation.com. Yeah, so we're going to put that up. So please go and check it out because like she said, we always think about like Garrett Moore's um, created the stoplight, but we don't know the behind that. Or Frederick Douglass, you know, the great abolitionist, but we don't know the the stories behind that. So thank you so much. Before we really get into some of our great history, I want to talk about love because I think that a lot of African-Americans or Black Afro-Americans, you know, we've been called all different kinds of things. I think we have a problem loving ourselves as African-Americans, as darker skinned people, because the country that we live in, and it's not really just this country, it's really the world. And nobody wants to be associated as a black person, you know what I'm saying? Or a person of color, if it's got to be linked to black people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really hurt me is because religion we are one of the largest religious groups and we still can't love ourselves. But the Bible says in Genesis 1 27, that God created man in his own image. Mm-hmm. Likeness, right. So, and then Genesis 1 31 says, and God saw everything that he made and called it very good. It now good. where did that disconnect come from an African Americans where we don't think that we're created in God's image and likeness and that we don't think that we were very good or are very good. What do you think? Now, when you don't love yourself, you don't love your history. Mm. So that goes hand in hand. Your, your identity, your self-identity, who you think you are is the most important idea you ever have in your life because that will give birth to every other idea you have about yourself. So when you think about slavery and the impact of slavery in the history of African-Americans, This idea about racism, if you look at history from the expanse of human history, it's really kind of a new concept. I mean, you really don't go back and read the Greeks and the Romans being racist about what they did. They were very brutal. Mm -hmm. They they crucified Jesus. I mean, they were very brutal, um, but you don't see the same type of racism. This is actually a new kind of construct in human history for the past four or 500 years with the advent of the Atlantic slave trade, if you want to call it. So when you ask why do Black people not love themselves, the system was set up for that. 
Do you understand? If you look at slavery, slavery was violence. There's no way you can keep people in chains for 400 years, although they fought back without violence and without the help of a lot of people. Authority figures, people who didn't actually own enslaved people, everybody had to support this. A large group of people had to support this and it had to go to your mind, your self-identity, freedom of religion. When you talk about being enslaved, almost every aspect of human life was attacked and a part of the system. It wasn't just one thing. Because when you came over, you were told to strip yourself of your name, strip yourself of your music, strip yourself of your understanding and how God had revealed himself to you. All that was stripped. And then you were given something in place of that, which was to tell you you were not important. You could not be important as a, other people who maybe look different than you. So the system was, was one of violence and was one that was comprehensive. So when we ask why, we have to know why. Because that's how it was designed. And some of us still, you know, we, we, we are hampered by that today because it's up to us as elders to teach our children our history. So when we fail to teach it, our children grow up without the proper identity of themselves. There are a lot of people who don't even want to learn about African-American history because it makes them uncomfortable because they think we come from slaves. But then yet we deal with the same problems that our ancestors had and was passed on to us and they dealt with it and we don't have their examples because we never read their stories. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. We have to be able to look back at and to deal with what we're dealing with today. Right. You know what? You you said something, and and I, we got to go to that point. So I don't know if you heard this, but back in 2018, Kanye West made a statement, and I, I, I wrote it down verbatim. When you hear about slavery for 400 years, for 400 years, that sounds like a choice. That infuriated me, and that is probably why I can't even listen to this, because that infuriated me so much. Because like you said, slavery was not slavery without violence. And then, like, let's talk about the revolt. Slaves did not just accept being slaves. Not all slaves, anyway. You had a lot of revolts. Most people only know about Nat Turner. I was Gabriel Prosser, um, Cato in South Carolina. Uh, Denmark Vesey in Charleston, and then not to mention the countless slaves that did like little individual things like poisoning their masters mm -hmm. or um, burning up the crops or they broke the machinery. And some of them, you know, unfortunately, some of them killed their babies so their babies wouldn't go into it. That was their form of rebellion. Some of them killed themselves and a lot of them, a lot of them ran away. Now, some of them got caught, but they ran away. And we saw, I mean, you know, people ran. It's not like they wanted to be in chains. They did not want to be enslaved. And I like to say enslaved because we were not slaves. Yes. We were enslaved Africans. We come from enslaved Africans. And something that happened to you wasn't who you were. Exactly. Exactly. You want to speak to that a little bit? So like, all, of, yeah. all of slavery was a revolt. Yeah. So uh, when I look at the whole experience of slavery, for the first, from the person who was chained and, and, and kept in those prisons and those cells in Africa, off the coast of Africa, and if you can remember the imagery you see from Roots, or if you've ever seen mm -hmm. Glory Allen, the first people who resisted, all of it was a result, it was a revolt. And when you think about it, it wasn't simply, as I mentioned, just a physical slavery. I mean, you could try to look point to one aspect of human nature that caused slavery to happen. Maybe it was greed, but it wasn't just greed. Mm -hmm. Some of the laws that were passed, some of the things that happened can't just be explained away by greed. So right. there was a lot of hatred. There was a lot of things going on in slavery. So even the person who did not let it get their mind was revolting. Mm -hmm. Even the person who came back, because as I thought about this, I thought a lot about Sally Hemings. Mm -hmm. And she is a, a fascinating person. I mean, she, her story is fascinating. I mean, for years, there was discussion about whether or not Thomas Jefferson fathered her children. Now there's not much more of a discussion because you have DNA evidence and all of the evidence is done and you can go to monticello.org and look all that up. But to me, she is the ultimate me too person. Mm. She's the ultimate me too. Okay. And, and it's like her life and her story speaks to me because she didn't have much of a choice. And when we think about it, you know, she, she was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson, but it wasn't just her, it was her whole family. Her mother was enslaved by Thomas Jefferson, her family, her brothers and sisters. And when she went to France to be with him, she was 14 years old. And he was 44. 
Wow. Most of that's not even talked about, right? No, it's not. It's not talked about. And her, and I believe her brother was also there for a period of time because he brought her brother there as well. So people talk about why was she in France and why didn't she just stay? But you don't remember her whole family was enslaved by him, by this man. Right. And by this time, he was one of the most famous people, certainly in America and in, and in the European world. He's one of the most famous people and had a lot of clout in France when he was there. Mm-hmm. So why, did, why didn't she fight there? Well, first of all, she was 14. But she decided to go back under a promise that supposedly he was going to free their children, should they have. And she came back pregnant at a, as a teenager at the time. And he was in his 40s, which, which we should know. Why did she come back? And part of my thought, that's part of the story. Did you, did, why did she come back? Maybe she came back because her mother was enslaved. Right. Like, people don't give her that, that right to be human. That maybe the people who decided to come back and fight, just like Harriet Tubman came back for a family, came right. back to make a life as best they could with their family so that their spirits wouldn't be lost. Right. So that their souls, would, they weren't just fighting for physical freedom, which they obviously wanted. They were fighting to keep their mind of self-determination. Right. There's a lady, her name is Mom Bet, Elizabeth Bet. If you ever look her up, you, you look at the Massachusetts Historical Society, mm-hmm. but she was one of the people who got freedom early on in Massachusetts. And they write about her in her whole court case. She went to court. It was a whole lot with the Massachusetts Constitution. But she's famous for saying, once she became free, if at any point in time while I was a slave, if one minute of freedom had been offered to me, just 60 seconds, and I was told at the end of that 60 seconds, I would have to die, I would gladly have taken it just to spend 60 seconds on God's green earth, a free woman. Wow. She wasn't, to me, when I read that, it summed it up. She wasn't fighting for material things. She didn't say, give me money. She just mm-hmm. wanted self-determination. So mm-hmm. when I think about slavery and revolt, our ancestors weren't just fighting simply for the physical chains to go off, which is what you wanted. And we didn't fight simply to have money or houses. We wanted that freedom that comes only from your self-identification, from who you know in terms of as a, as a God. And that was stripped away from you when it comes to slavery. Right. So for those people who fought against that, you know, I'm amazed when I, when I was looking at this book and I think about, you know, Sojourner so Truth, there's a lot she went through with her son, Mm-hmm. Oh, a whole lot she went through with her son when she tried to get her son back and her son was sold to Alabama and he was being abused and beaten by a man in Alabama and she had to go to court. Here's a black woman in the 1800s who had never owned a dollar in her life had, or never had a dollar in her life going to court to fight for her son. And she right. brought him back because right. of her faith. She said at one point in time when they were telling her, your son's going to come back, don't worry about it. She said, no, God told me that my son would be back immediately. And while they were telling her that she had to wait a couple of months for things, which said, no, God told me this. And her faith literally got her things coming to her. People who came to her support said, go see this man, go tell that man. And she ended up seeing a man about a man, so to speak, (laughs) who went and got her son kind of in those kind of ways, like a bounty hunter who went and go get her son and brought him to court. And they had to have a court case. And her son was so scared that he was saying he had no mother and nobody in this place. And when she came, he started screaming. And when they looked at her son, he had sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And she said she could take his finger, her fingers and put on his back. And his back looked like whelks, like when you put your fingers together all over his back. Mm-hmm. He had been abused. But she saved him from that abuse. And her mm-hmm. fight was about her faith in God. Her fight was for us. It wasn't for physicality. It wasn't for any of that. So when I say revolt, revolt happened in a lot of different ways. The mm-hmm. fact that we didn't let it break our spirit. The fact that she didn't let that break her spirit. She was never a rich woman. She died poor, unfortunately. But she was, she was certainly a woman of God and somebody who never let that break her spirit. Our fight was much deeper than material things. And we have to realize that. And you know what? When you were saying that, I was just thinking how when you talk about we, us as elders, this is funny how we, we're elders. I know, right? <laughs> but us as elders and just the people, we have to really teach our children that first fact that they are made in the image of God and that God loves them that the God is within them. It's like God is their spirit. Spirit of God resides within us. And we have to acknowledge that. Forget about other people acknowledging. We have to acknowledge that as who we are and all the greatness that we have. And God speaks to us. Just like you said, Sir Journal Truth, she knew that God spoke to her and she was willing to move on that. And yes, I do want reparations because I believe that they owe us that because everybody else gets it. But in the same sense, that we have to be mindful that we need to be teaching our children and their children that we are created in the image of God and that nobody, no matter their color, is better than us. 
nobody deserves more than us we are and then but we are free mm -hmm. but we have to get free up here from the religion like you said from the religion that that was taught to us and now i i you know this is gonna sound real crazy to some people because i got a lot of christians that's listening to this but we got to remember that the the Christianity that was taught to our people was a Christianity based on fear and, and wanted to keep us from knowing who we were. And so they showed us a white Jesus. Even though now, when I was over in Italy, I learned why they even made Jesus look like that. Because Michelangelo, I think it was Michelangelo, right? When he did this um, Last Supper, he oh, did. I think Da Vinci did the supper. Da, Mike da, Vinci, da Vinci, I'm sorry, Da yeah. Vinci. When Da Vinci did the Last Supper, he created, he made them look like the Italians who commissioned him to do the work. <laughs> okay, so watch this. So why do we, why are we so focused on this picture of Jesus when Da Vinci said he created these people to look like the people that, that gave him the money? So it's okay that I got black Jesus on my wall. I mean, think about it. So, and people, they'll come to our house and be like, oh, y'all got black Jesus on the wall. Lorenzo, my son, he'll say, oh, can we just say Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but the whole thing is like, I've like indoctrinated him because, and then people say it shouldn't matter what color. Yeah, it matters in my house because I need my son to see that God can look like him. So he will understand that God resides in him because God didn't make a color. God didn't make a race. He didn't make a male or female. The spirit of us is not any of those things. But because we live in this world and we are dressed in these earthly bodies, we have to be able to teach our children to be able to look in the mirror and see God. And you can't do that with a white Jesus on the wall. I'm sorry. You, I say, y'all don't, don't send it to WYTV7. Y'all can comment and y'all can send it to Ray Kale at RayKellToson.com, but that's just how I believe. Santa Claus is black in my house, too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Raquel, reparations may never come. I, yeah. And that, that's one message I want to get out to people. And, and, and people in a various, it may never come. Mm -hmm. So what now, what do you do? When I see people fighting, I, I like when they had like the fight in the Dakotas about the oil pipeline that was going through and there were a lot of people, you know, saying how, how wrong Native Americans were or things that we see happen on the border with immigration. And we're waiting for somebody who might be in a position, quote unquote, of power to help free it and make it different. What if it never comes? Mm. And, one, and that whole idea about self-identity and realizing who you are and God inside you comes with that because your freedom is not going to come from anybody. I'm not saying that I don't completely agree from reparations. I kind of hope that it doesn't come so that it comes from us. Because if it comes from us, nobody can take it from you. If it comes from somebody else, they get to freight it up for you, tell you how much you get, where, you, where, are you going, where is it going to go. Define how your freedom and your reparations is, is made. But if it comes from you, no one takes it. Mm. And so when I think about the only reparation, the only repairing that's going to take place, truly it has to take place within us. So in a sense, I'm almost glad it hasn't happened because we ourselves have to take it upon ourselves to make recommit our communities teach our children the way we're supposed to teach them. Because if we teach your children like that, the, the solutions to the problems we face will come around automatically, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is no solution outside of you. When you think about God being inside of you, Jesus, you know, looked at God and said, you know, prayed and said before he made a sacrifice, Lord, if you can take this from me, take this from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done. Let yours be done. Jesus understood that there was nobody coming. God wasn't going to send his host of angels. The sacrifice and the promise that had to come place and take place through him. And I don't think why well, we think we don't have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. If Jesus had to sacrifice and Jesus had to go through something difficult, and so did our ancestors, I don't know why we don't think that the same salvation and the same challenges we're going to have to go through. We are. Every generation has their own movement. That's what Coretta Scott, Scott King said. Every generation has their own civil rights movement, so to speak. And the, the, the movement, the promise of that comes through you. It comes mm -hmm. through us. It can come no other way. It would be incomplete if it came any other way. Right. Yeah, that's really good. Look, I, it's really interesting to me when we talk about just being an African-American in society today and how, you, like you said, we all have our, um, we all have to, we have a fight. We all have to sacrifice. We all have to do something. And, and it's really interesting because everybody's fight is not the same. 
Like you have the people that are like the Black Lives Matter people. You have like my, my good friend, Benjamin Crump, who's out there fighting the good fight, you know, in, in the courtroom. You have all these, and then I was like, but I really feel like my part is really to get into the consciousness of the people. And if I can raise the consciousness of a few people for them to see themselves as God and understand that through their thoughts and their consciousness, they can change their life, their community, their world. I, I feel like I'm doing my part, you know, and everybody's like, everybody wasn't out there with Martin Luther King. Everybody went out there because we had a Malcolm X that was doing his thing, you know what I'm saying? And we needed them all. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody has to realize, don't put other people, because you know, sometimes woke folk, everybody say you woke, woke. Everybody put people down because you're not doing this or you're not doing that. But do your part. And I just feel my part really is to raise the consciousness because when I get people that look like me to really understand the power that they, they have between their ears, Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to be some bad people. Mm -hmm. And it's not even about, like you said, it's not just about material things, but we can change some things. We can be homeowners. We can be landowners. The things that we are, like when you said reparations, even though I'm still holding out for hope, <laughs> but even the without the reparations, we can still own the homes. We can still own businesses. We can still do that stuff. You know what I mean? Because our ancestors did it. Mm -hmm. we, um, we only got 10 minutes, but I mean, our ancestors in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they burned all our stuff down. They had done it. They had created wealth for themselves. White people got mad mm -hmm. and burned it all to the ground and killed as many people as they could. But we did it then. We can do it again. And we are really in a place where we can do it now. But we have to get it in our consciousness, mm -hmm. you know? We can't, and then, you know, I don't feel like we're enslaved mentally now. I just feel like we are, we still don't really get who we are and how powerful we are. We don't need guns. If I could teach the kids and the boys in the hood so that they don't need guns, oh, the power that they have is not that gun. You know, it's like, you don't need that gun to be powerful. You got so many men walking around here in these neighborhoods they don't carry a gun, but they walk with so much power. Woo. Yeah. Well, I, want, I want you to think about this one guy we, we, we would look up. His name is Tr George Thomas Downing. Mm -hmm. He was a businessman in the 1800s. He was very wealthy. Uh, he was never enslaved. But when you look up and you read in his life, and I started reading about him, I found that he was connected with so many people with the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. He did fights here in D.C. when he came to work at Congress and, and managed the Congressional Dining Hall. But one of the things I found out when it comes to people like George Thomas Downing and the Underground Railroad, there were people just like you said, connected in different avenues. Somebody was working in business to fight for things to change in terms of interstate commerce or, or their, things were going. There were people fighting, hiding people <laughs> in houses, <laughs> right. church folks fighting. You had people like Frederick Douglass. There were literally secret connections of people, actually, mm -hmm. who coordinated their efforts to fight the laws that were taking place, to fight the fugitive slave law, and they were working in different avenues of society. So when you say you're doing this, you're doing it in a tradition of people who fought against slavery in the 1800s, and you don't even know it. <laughs> Look we, at we, that. We, we mentioned Ma Malcolm X, but you're doing it to people like this, and yeah. we don't even know how, how they had secret right. societies and secret things that they did, connections, right. where they were working. It was all underground. They had to be underground. Because right. they were fighting against the law at the time. So if we can look back at their examples, we will find there were a lot of courageous people who did a lot of things. Some of them were enslaved and many of them were not. And mm -hmm. a lot of the people who were not enslaved would not go back to Africa because they had family members enslaved here so we can't leave them. Right. So we're going to fight in the law. We're going to fight in the streets. We're going we're gonna to hide them. We're going to work together. We're going to secretly help because they couldn't do everything openly. But, the, but there's a tradition of that. And you're actually living in that tradition. You know it. Right, right. Look at that. Janita, you put, put your book up again and um, read the title for everybody who's listening. It's called Stories About Black History. Yeah. So you can and see it says it. volume two. So there's a volume one. Yes. And that's like an ebook on Amazon. There's a volume three. And a volume three. So you have three volumes. Okay. And yeah, you're just going to keep going because we still making history. You know what? My nephew, he says something. He's like, black history is American history. Because most of the history, like when we talk about 
our history. We're, we're talking about the history here. We don't usually deal with the African history. We usually deal with the history of the Africans that were here in America. And that's mm -hmm. American history. And I remember um, somebody saying that really the first American genre really was Negro spirituals because the white people in America was, you know, doing like singing the Irish lyric, you know, lyric, whatever those things. And they were singing uh, songs from their old country. Mm -hmm. But the Negro spiritual was developed here in America. Mm -hmm. It was, and unfortunately it was out of pain and trauma, but it was also out of hope. Mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. were, and then, so when you just look at American music, it's our music. Most of the stuff, I mean, the, the doggone, the Washington monuments built by Africans, you know, African American history is American history. So it's not just Black History Month, even though I love Black History Month and we celebrate it, but it's our history is all throughout American history and in schools our kids should learn these things it should be interwoven it shouldn't be just teaching them in February no it should be interwoven because our history is American history because where are you going to go back to your family is born here your grandparents right. your grandparents are buried here I mean right. this, we help you help build the country we this is a part this is our land and it doesn't yes. mean you don't look at your entire your entire heritage you do but here's where your family is here's where you're they're buried here it is right. funny. You know, it's funny that it was a song that's like, this land is your land, this land is our land, okay? And that part is like, we belong here. Even though we are a small minority, mm -hmm. but we belong here and we need to love ourselves. We need to love our heritage, our culture, our history. Mm -hmm. Love ourselves, the God in ourselves. If you can't love yourself, you won't love your history. Exactly. And once we love ourselves, we can love our history, and we will make history. We will make history. And I and I really I really believe that. Thank you so much. We gotta go. It was went so fast. We got like so much stuff. But everybody go to Danita's website. What is it again? It's blackandeducation.com. Black and education. Dot com to learn more so you can have stuff to teach your children about their history and then your books all three volumes are on amazon.com yep along and with other books as well right and it's called stories about black history stories about black history and i have this one too about harriet tubman they can't pull us up they can't pull us up and that's on amazon too yep Go get these books. It's the end of Black History Month, but we're going to celebrate Black History all year round. So go get the books today and start teaching your children about our history. And it's not just slavery, but even in the slavery, there's so much strength and faith and overcoming that you can teach them. We don't have to teach our kids to make it a burden, but to make it so they can see the blessing out of it because everything we are blessed people and i just had to bring it right back to blessed <laughs> can i say one thing rachel one more thing go ahead you think about job and the story of job in the bible we read a lot about struggle and how people were, went through a lot of things why do we have to read just about that when we can see god working in our lives and our ancestors and our, the very blood that runs through your veins the stories that you can get motivation from so it's yeah. not just what you see in the Bible. God was working right here in your life. So I think that's important for us to make that parallel. Yes. Amen. Amen. Okay, everybody. You have had your Black history, a small dose of your Black history lessons for today. Go get the books by Danita Smith on Amazon. She has some great books, some great lessons. Please, please, please teach your children your grandchildren, your nieces and nephews, the little kids at church, that they are God. They were made in the image and the likeness of him and that they come from powerful people. Be blessed, everyone. Until next week. Bye-bye.